All right, and we're back. Uh, this is our one, two, three, four session of the day. It's a very special session because we are going to discuss some things uh, very interesting. And I believe uh, it has developed a lot in the past uh, few years, especially in Indonesia. We're going to discuss about geriatric anesthesia. Mm, very interesting. And we will have four prominent speakers. The first one is uh, Dr. Ratna Farida from Indonesia. Hi. Hi, the second Get one already. <laughs> <laughs> young at heart, young at heart. <laughs> the second, the second speaker is yeah. <laughs> and the second the speaker old, is the quite disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> from Gabriela from Italy, and the third speaker is Dr. Richard Griffith from UK, and last but not least is Dr. Bernadette Fearing from Netherlands. As for this, uh, the moderator for this session will be Prof. Nancy Margarita Rehata from Indonesia. Prof. Rita, please. Okay. As Sorry, are you speaking with me? Because the audio is very disturbed. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, we can hear you, Gabriela. Yes, I am here. I'm happy to be uh, with you. And my best greetings to our Indonesia family, even though only virtually it is a uh, Again, a pleasure meeting you all. And uh, but I think that before my presentation, there is another one from an uh, Indonesian colleague, and yes. I'm waiting to be called yeah. to speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Gabriela. So we will start now. Uh, thank you, Krista. Uh, I'm the moderator for this session, the last session. Mm -hmm. Yes, Krista, it's the last session. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, second from last. Second <laughs> from last. Uh, so we will start. And as uh, what uh, Krisa said, that the first speaker is Dr. Ratna Farida. Dr. Ratna Farida is from Indonesia. And I think everybody already, uh, it, she is well known for us because one is a part of Indonesian anesthesiologist. And as you know, we all the fa the fifth um, contributor here is all geriatric, so we will just talk uh, better <laughs> about the geriatric. Okay, uh, please, Dr. Ratna, you have thirty minutes time. Okay, thank you, Prof. Rehata, my beloved teacher. But first of all, um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to apologize because last year I spoke in uh, English and I got uh, some uh, protest from audience. So uh, uh, this time I'd like to uh, present in Bahasa Indonesia, if you don't mind, Prof. Rayhata. Okay. It's okay um, as long as your slide is in English. Yeah, it's not in Russian. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, in English. <laughs> Wait a minute, I just tried to share my slide. Um, why is I, Krisha, I got a difficulty in okay. sharing my slide. Could you please help me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I got a problem in in my uh, internet today. Apologize for that. Okay, selamat siang semuanya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Topik kita hari ini semuanya tentang orang tua. Yang ngomong juga sudah tua. Uh, kerjanya juga di rumah sakit yang sudah tua. Terus, can I? Okay, this is uh, our hospital yang umurnya sudah lebih dari 100 tahun. Sudah tua sekali dan tidak banyak berubah sejak 100 tahun yang lalu. Silakan, let's next. Oke, okay. kita bicara uh, oleh karena memang populasi dunia sudah lebih tua sekarang. Uh, pertambahan penduduk dengan usia 60 itu sangat pesat. Slide please. Bahkan pada tahun ini, uh, tahun lalu 2020 itu populasi uh, geriatrik itu sudah lebih tinggi dari balita. Dan kelihatannya ini akan terus bertambah sehingga slide please sehingga uh, kesempatan kita atau 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 um, uh, probability kita untuk membius uh, 
pasien geriatrik itu juga meningkat, sangat meningkat. Dan seharusnya juga diikuti dengan kesadaran kita bahwa pasien-pasien ini adalah suatu populasi khusus yang mungkin juga perlu diperlakukan secara khusus, tidak sama dengan pasien yang lain. Slide, please. Oke, okay, postoperatif, kognitif dysfunction sudah merupakan um, hal yang sangat terkenal sekarang, terutama menyangkut pasien geriatrik. Dahulu uh, concernnya lebih banyak pada pasien kardiak ya, uh, tapi sekarang kelihatannya kita sudah lebih aware bahwa ini bisa terjadi pada pasien apa, uh, operasi apa saja, terutama menyangkut pasien tua. Insidensnya memang sangat bervariasi. Mengapa? Karena Patut kita sadari juga bahwa penilaian POC di fungsi kognisi ini belum merata di seluruh dunia, belum menjadi sesuatu yang rutin, ya, dan pencatatan juga tidak baik, tidak seperti yang kita harapkan. Kita tidak tahu apakah orang-orang menggunakan tes kognisi untuk mengenali apakah terjadi POC di apa tidak pada pasien-pasien mereka. Barangkali justru angka ini bisa lebih tinggi kalau semua orang sudah melakukan pemeriksaan kognisi pra-bedah. Kemudian untuk cardiac surgery kelihatannya sudah uh, uh, sangat rata, ya sekitar 50 persen di seluruh dunia. Uh, tentu ini berhubungan juga dengan penggunaan mesin CPB. Di rumah sakit kami, Tahun 2018 kami mendapati angkanya 40,7 persen untuk cardiac surgery dan ternyata tahun 2019 naik menjadi 51 persen. Artinya ini memang suatu masalah yang nyata kadang-kadang kita tidak sadari karena kita tidak POCD, kadang-kadang kita tidak sadar karena subtol sekali gejalanya tidak ada yang tahu kalau tidak dilakukan pemeriksaan yang khusus mengenai fungsi kondisi ini. Karena angkanya tetap tinggi dan barangkali lebih tinggi dari ini, sepatutnya lah kita berusaha untuk lebih menekan ini supaya tidak terjadi. Slide please. Kenapa pasien-pasien geriatrik lebih susceptible, lebih rentan untuk mengalami POCD? Tentu secara alami, secara alami memang terjadi degenerasi ya pada sel-sel tubuh manusia sejalan dengan bertambahnya usia. Jadi jumlah sel-sel parenkim yang aktif itu turun bisa dikatakan pada semua organ, tidak terkecuali pada otak. Dan ini dialami oleh semua orang, bahkan pada pasien geriatri yang sangat sehat. Itu juga terjadi. Proses degenerasi ini adalah sesuatu yang alami. Jadi perlu juga diingat bahwa Sebagian besar pasien-pasien geriatrik juga sudah memiliki komorbid. Komorbidnya bisa berbagai macam, ya. Yang termasuk komorbid yang paling sering diantaranya adalah penyakit-penyakit kardiovaskular, kardiovaskular dan cerebral. Jadi pada pasien-pasien ini, kemudian biasanya juga aktivitas fisik kan sudah turun, tidak seaktif orang seusia krisa misalnya, ya. Jadi Makin tidak aktif seorang pasien juga makin tidak baik karena apalagi jika sudah masuk dalam tahap bedridden tentu risiko untuk terjadinya tromboemboli juga semakin tinggi. Uh, slide please. Kita bisa lihat ini adalah penelitian Shen dan kawan-kawan di Cina. Dia merekrut subjek-subjeknya itu orang-orang normal ya, uh, suka relawan membandingkan seperti apa sih volume otak pada orang dewasa dengan geriatrik. Dan kita bisa melihat ini pada pasien geriatrik yang cukup sehat, kelihatan sekali perbedaan volume otak pada yang masih muda dengan yang sudah dewasa. Slide please. Satu hal yang agak mengejutkan bagi saya adalah kenyataan bahwa otak kanan-kiri pada pasien subjek laki-laki dan perempuan memang berbeda. Yang hitam itu adalah yang muda, yang abu-abu, yang setelah tua. Kita bisa melihat volume otak kanan perempuan muda lebih tinggi daripada otak kirinya. Dan kebalikannya pada laki-laki. Tapi ketika sudah tua, ternyata regresi penurunan volume otak kanan laki-laki jauh lebih besar dari perempuan. Jadi buat para aki-aki dan nini-nini, 
uh, ya itu harus disadari kalau aki-aki lebih bawel lebih susah diomongin mungkin otak kanannya memang lebih susut that's why I strongly uh, suggest Dr. Susilo to not to stop playing music supaya otak kanannya nggak susut okay. slide this uh, sebetulnya mekanisme pasti uh, terjadinya POCD ini masih berupa hipotesis hipotesis ya akan tetapi makin ke sini makin kuat uh, dugaan bahwa hal ini diperantarai oleh uh, respons inflamasi. Kalau kita membaca literatur-literatur mengenai POCD hampir semuanya mengarah seolah-olah ini semata-mata karena anestesi. Jadi ini salahnya anestesi. Tapi sebetulnya tidak, karena ternyata reaksi inflamasi ini pencetusnya bukan cuma anestesia, tapi juga respon stres pembedahan. Jadi kedua hal ini berpengaruh terhadap pemicu terhadap terjadinya POCD. Dan ini dapat dibuktikan bahwa biomarker yang dapat menandakan adanya kerusakan saraf ini memang meningkat pada pasien-pasien yang mengalami POCD. Boleh slide? Salah satu yang sebetulnya belum ada konsensus biomarker apa sih yang paling paling tepat untuk memprediksi uh, POCD pada pada pasien-pasien geriatrik dan pasien yang lain juga. Akan tetapi ada beberapa yang menyebutkan S100B. Protein S100B itu termasuk uh, penanda kerusakan neuron yang sangat uh, kuat ya dan dikatakan kadarnya dalam serum meningkat pada pasien-pasien POCD. Kami juga membuktikan dalam penelitian telah kami lakukan memang iya. Jadi pada pasien POCD kadarnya lebih tinggi daripada yang non POCD. Tapi ini pada pasien hmm, cardiac surgery boleh uh, next. Jadi dikatakan insisi pembedahan dan anestesia itu memicu reaksi inflamasi dan yang disebut BMDM, bone marrow derived monocytes itu yang uh, kemudian memproduksi mediator-mediator <coughs> inflamasi dan pada gilirannya juga membuka blood brain barrier, disrupsi. Sekali dia masuk ke dalam uh, sistem saraf, maka dia akan meneruskan produksi sel-sel infla uh, mediator inflamasi dan pada akhirnya akan mengaktifasi mikroglia. Katanya mikroglia yang activated ini yeah. yang berpengaruh uh, terhadap terjadinya POCD. Namun uh, peneliti ini siapa namanya Tan dari Cina juga dia juga menyatakan ada uh, ada namanya gut brain axis ya yang kelihatannya jauh ya antara otak dengan gut tapi ternyata ada kemungkinan ada pengaruh juga yang dapat uh, mem memperjelas atau meningkatkan terjadinya POCD. Oleh slide. Dan ternyata kalau kita baca berbagai literatur itu baik anestetik inhalasi atau intravenous kedua-duanya punya potensi untuk untuk uh, mencetuskan POCD. Kita bisa lihat um, ada yang namanya substansi amyloid beta peptide ini banyak ditemukan pada pasien-pasien Alzheimer spontan terbentuk entah dari mana ya dan ternyata ini juga ditemukan meningkat kadarnya pada hewan coba sih yang mengalami POCD. Jadi pada ini pada tikus ya kita lagi senang ngomongin tikus nih sekarang. Ternyata peningkatan kadar amyloid beta peptide ini berhubungan dengan turunnya kemampuan kemamp kognisi kognisi tikus. Kita tahu tikus itu pinter ya, tapi dengan peningkatan kadar ini kemampuan mereka turun. Dan ini uh, ternyata ditemukan lebih tinggi memang pada pas, uh, pasien tikus tikus yang tua dibandingkan tikus yang muda. Uh, katanya volatile anesthetics itu juga meningkatkan kadar amyloid beta peptide. Sedangkan intravena uh, katanya berpengaruh terhadap fosforilasi protein tau. Protein tau itu seperti hmm, seperti apa ya? Seperti beton yang mempertahankan uh, integritas 
mikrotubulus pada akson-akson saraf itu ya. Jadi kalau protein taunya terfosforasi dia protol gitu. Integritas selnya juga terganggu dan dikatakan ada korelasi antara meningkatnya tau protein ini dengan kerusakan otak dengan infak otak. Nah, anestetik in, intravena katanya juga membantu meningkatkan fosforilasi tau protein dengan kata lain membantu me, menyebabkan disrupsi pada tubulus eh, mikrotubulus pada akson ini. Um, banyak penelitian sudah dilakukan slide please tentang apa saja sih faktor-faktor risiko banyak sekali disebutkan faktor risiko yang menyebabkan seseorang pasien geriatrik itu lebih mudah untuk mengalami POCD banyak sekali ya dalam um, oksigen konten termasuk diantaranya kemudian Apakah dalam operasi itu dia kehilangan darah lebih dari 500? Apakah sebelum pembedahan apa namanya lekositnya sudah tinggi duluan? Kemudian apakah pada early post op period itu fas nyerinya lebih dari 4, jadi pain? Kalau di penelitian kami pasca CPB itu ada cut off pointnya sebetulnya 10 ya pada pasien-pasien yang mengalami POCD itu kadar HB sekitar 8 di bawah 10 itu lebih lebih banyak pada pasien POCD. Kemudian kami juga menjumpai desaturasi. Waktu total desaturasi serebri itu intra CPB selama pembedahan jantung totalnya lebih dari 55 menit itu signifikan berhubungan dengan POCD. Tentu mungkin angkanya tidak persis sama di tempat-tempat lain barangkali juga berbeda tapi intinya adalah desaturasi yang terjadi selama anestesia itu berpengaruh terhadap terjadinya POCD. Slide please. Kemudian ada beberapa yang menambahkan juga lama, lama pembedahan dan anestesia mungkin juga berpengaruh dan sekali lagi sama dengan penelitian kami kalau oksigenasi otak selama operasi itu rendah slide please. Jadi bagaimana uh, anestesia itu dapat cukup aman untuk pasien geriatrik? Uh, sekali lagi banyak sekali literatur yang meneliti mengenai pengaruh berbagai macam obat anestetik maupun uh, teknik anestesia terhadap terjadinya POCD. Namun hasilnya juga sama beragamnya dan uh, kalau kita agak berkecil hati mungkin agak membingungkan karena ada beberapa yang kontradiktif juga. Boleh kita lihat salah satunya adalah pernyataan bahwa tidak ada perbedaan mau pakai teknik apapun, yang regional maupun anestesia umum tidak ada beda. Akan Tetapi dalam penelitian ini perlu dilihat juga bahwa regional anestesia di situ ada yang pakai sedasi juga. Jadi pertanyaannya, Benar nggak sih regional juga menyebabkan POCD? Kalau mungkin nggak ditambah sedasi, apakah angkanya sama? ya Kemudian ada yang menyebutkan juga bahwa kalau dia ambulatory surgery dengan anggapan bahwa ambulatory surgery itu lebih cepat, lebih singkat waktunya, dan operasinya juga tidak terlalu complicated, maka POCD-nya juga lebih rendah. Kecuali jika frailty score-nya sejak awal sudah tinggi. Oke, lanjut. Ada lagi meneliti bahwa ketamin ternyata punya efek yang baik untuk POCD. Ada yang meneliti membandingkan intraoperatif eh, eh, apa, rumatan anestesianya, ada yang satu kelompok satu, eh, ketamin, satu lagi fentanil. Ada juga yang memberikan ketamin low dose ya, sebelum eh, anestesia, dan dikatakan hasilnya juga baik. Ada penelitian-penelitian lain yang berbagai macam, boleh dilihat lagi slide-nya. Uh, ini di Cina juga, dia memberikan skopolamin intramuskular sebelum anestesia dan dikatakan uh, S100B itu lebih rendah pada pasien yang mendapat perlakuan uh, POCD-nya lebih rendah juga dibandingkan yang tidak mendapat perlakuan. Akan tapi saya harus ingatkan bahwa semua ini tingkatnya masih hipotetikal. Belum ada yang betul-betul terbukti uh, sangat-sangat berpengaruh terhadap terjadinya POCD. 
kita bisa lanjut. Kenapa asetilkolin tadi ya? Kenapa kolin esterase? Katanya anestesia itu membuat asetilkolin terkuras. Dan pada pasien geriatrik memang asetilkolinnya sudah lebih rendah dibandingkan orang deo, uh, muda. Jadi kalau diberikan anestetik itu seperti terkuras. Karena itu selintas kita pikir kok agak kontradiktif ya. Kalau asetilkolinnya sedikit kenapa dikasih kolin esterase? Rupanya kolin esterase ini membantu untuk supaya tidak terkuras. Uh, asetilkolin yang ada. Tapi sekali lagi itu hipotetikal. Jangan jangan uh, serta-merta diambil sebagai uh, apa ya acuan untuk melakukan anestesia saat ini. Oke? Okay? Ya, asetilkolin memang sedikit uh, menurun jumlahnya pada pasien-pasien geriatrik dan juga uh, apa namanya menurun pada pasien dengan anestesia umum yang dilakukan ventilasi mekanis dengan low volume dan e, di, diharapkan pemberian antikolinergik ini dapat me, mencegah pengurasan asetilkolin lebih lanjut. Silakan lan, lanjut. Ada beberapa e, author yang me, menganjurkan bahwa untuk pasien-pasien geriatrik sebaiknya tidak dilakukan secara rutin pemberian premedikasi, medikasi peranestesia terutama yang sifatnya sedasi ya. Kemudian e, ini kontradiktif juga. Satu orang menyatakan propofol tiopental nggak apa-apa. Tapi di penelitian lain ada menyatakan tiopental. Nanti kita lihat pada slide berikutnya bahwa tiopental juga dapat menurunkan, dapat meningkatkan POCD. Kemudian dianjurkan jika mungkin dihindari anestesia umum kalau masih bisa dengan regional, sebaiknya menggunakan regional tapi kalau regional ditambah sedasi dalam itu sama juga bohong katanya ya jadi yang dianjurkan jika regional ya regional saja atau dengan light sedation saja lanjut nah, ini adalah beberapa uh, daftar obat yang katanya perlu dihindari kita lihat barbiturat tiopental itu barbiturat tapi tadi uh, dianjurkan sekarang seharusnya dihindari jadi masih semuanya serba masih tanda tanya, masih meraba-raba, kita tidak tahu persis sebetulnya apa yang berpengaruh, apa yang menguntungkan, dan apa yang tidak menguntungkan. Baik, lanjut. Yang jelas adalah kita sudah harus lebih aware, harus lebih mawas diri bahwa pasien geriatrik yang kita hadapi makin lama makin banyak, sudah saatnya kita duduk bersama sebagai suatu tim. Selama ini ada geriat gerontologis, ada pemegang pisau, ada anestesiologis, masing-masing bekerja sendiri, belum pernah sama-sama duduk. Karena uh, harusnya ini sudah menjadi suatu teamwork. ya. Jadi kita harus membicarakan setiap pasien geriatrik kita, karena karakteristik paris pasien juga tidak persis sama satu dengan yang lain, operasinya juga tidak sama, risiko uh, yang dihadapi juga tidak sama, jadi tidak serta-merta cukup seorang pemegang pisau mengirim pasien untuk melihat kelayakan dari ahli-ahli geriatrik kita. Layak atau tidak, nggak cukup. Kemudian yang penting juga bahwa kita membiasakan membuat frailty score pada semua pasien geriatrik sebelum pembedahan. Satu hal yang kita belum, sebentar, boleh balik sebentar, satu hal yang kita belum laksanakan di Indonesia adalah rutinitas memeriksa kondisi. Sudah saatnya saya kira kita punya suatu modalitas yang ringan untuk memeriksa kognisi pasien geriatrik prabedah. Ada beberapa scoring system, tapi tidak semuanya simple, tidak semuanya visible untuk dilakukan dalam sekian menit saja. Yang kita perlukan adalah sesuatu yang mudah dilakukan untuk mereka yang melakukan KPA pasien tidak memakan waktu dan bisa diulang-ulang terus mungkin kita harus uh, mengusulkan ini pada WFSA ya agar menentukan atau merekomendasikan apa sih uh, kondisi tes yang dapat kita aplikasikan dalam praktek sehari-hari baik um, ini adalah contoh yang 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 ori ya sering digunakan adalah Uh, frailty scale yang ini kayaknya ini banyak ya sudah tahu ya atau kita bisa ada juga uh, frailty scale uh, menurut Edmonton Kanada juga sama-sama Kanada uh, 
bisa juga menggunakan battle index macam-macam terserah sih tapi uh, yang penting ada hmm, apa ya penilaian terhadap frailty pasien-pasien kita slide please ini Edmonton maaf terlalu kecil ya lanjut uh, kemudian dianjurkan juga untuk memiliki checklist prabedah pada pasien-pasien geriatrik ini terutama di dalamnya menyangkut siapa nih yang akan jadi uh, caregiver yang akan uh, mengambil keputusan jika uh, terjadi sesuatu pada pasien jadi itu harus lengkap kita belum punya juga kayaknya uh, apa checklist seperti ini ya kemudian perlu juga dipertimbangkan lamanya puasa jangan lupa bahwa uh, clear fluid dua jam sebelum anestesia itu uh, sebaiknya betul-betul di dilakukan kemudian pencegahan tromboembolis pada pasien yang memang high risk perlu dilakukan dan obat yang nggak perlu stop yang perlu lanjut itu harus dipastikan juga dalam checklist ini semua ada jadi mudah-mudahan tidak ada yang terlewat lanjut oke ini ada sedikit hasil meta analisis kayaknya ya yang menyatakan bahwa regional anestesia itu memiliki banyak sekali keuntungan pada pasien-pasien geriatrik sedikit saja kerugian misalnya eh, hipotensi lebih lebih eh, nyata tapi sebagian besar memiliki kelebihan dibandingkan anestesia umum saja lanjut eh, sekalipun demikian kita betul-betul tidak tahu sebetulnya pasti itu apa sih penyebabnya kayaknya sih multifaktor ya tidak melulu uh, oleh karena zat anestetik saja dan ternyata POCD juga timbul pada pasien yang kita anggap tidak berisiko tinggi jadi tentu uh, ada hal-hal tertentu hal-hal lain di samping memang pasiennya berbakat atau berisiko tinggi untuk mengalami POCD kita juga tahu bahwa kerusakan saraf ini dapat terjadi intraoperatif oleh banyak macam hal. Waktu saya berapa menit lagi, Prof? Uh, five minutes more. Oke, okay. let's make it brief. Oke, okay. salah satu modalitas yang bisa kita gunakan adalah memantau uh, tingkat oksigenasi cerebral. Saya tidak mengatakan bahwa jika kita menggunakan NIRS ini, maka sudah pasti POCD tidak terjadi. Tidak. Sama dengan kita menggunakan saturasi oksigen. Apakah dengan menggunakan saturasi perifer itu udah pasti pasiennya tidak akan hipoksia? Tidak. Tapi kita bisa mengetahui lebih dini bahwa terjadi sesuatu event. Oke, bisa lanjut. Jadi ada korelasi antara RSO2 yang desaturasi terjadi dengan POCD pada pasien-pasien. Dikatakan jika desaturasi artinya turunnya nilai RSO2 itu lebih dari 20% dari baseline dan lama, itu bisa mencetuskan POCD. Tapi apa yang mencetuskan RSO2 itu turun? Banyak hal. Kita bisa lihat, slide please. Apakah uh, oksigen delivery? Oksigen delivery ini harus dipantau juga, cukup atau tidak, ada bleeding atau tidak, HB turun. Apakah ada hipotensi? Ini sering terjadi. Atau hipertensi? Apakah ada episode episode hipoksik meskipun sedikit sedikit sebentar sebentar ya? Dan terakhir apakah kardiak output kira-kira cukup untuk pasien? Kadang-kadang kita menganggap bahwa kardiak output cukup diwakili dengan tekan darah dan itu rasanya tidak tidak pas ya. Kita boleh lihat slide berikutnya. Jangan lupa bahwa perfusi organ tidak hanya bergantung dengan tekanan darah. Namun kita lihat ada prinsip. Uh, saya tidak bisa klik, tolong klik. Oke, okay. jadi jangan lupa bahwa flow itu berbanding terbalik dengan resistensi. Kalau kita menganggap uh, resistensi uh, tekanan darah itu berhubungan dengan resistensi, dan kita ingin menambah tekanan darah supaya lebih tinggi, kita harus ingat juga bahwa obat-obat yang meningkatkan resistensi justru dapat bersifat menurunkan flow karena berbanding terbalik. Oke, okay. boleh dilihat. Jadi kalau kita berikan vasokonstriktor dengan harapan tekanan darah naik dan kita berharap perfusi otak juga membaik, belum tentu. Kita harus tahu juga, klik please. Kalau vasokonstriktor itu akan meningkatkan tekanan darah, namun juga menurunkan flow, unless tekanan untuk melawan itu, P-nya, 
tinggi. Dari mana P-nya? Kita harus tahu bahwa pasien mampu atau tidak jantungnya melawan resistensi itu untuk menghasilkan flow, cardiac output yang cukup. Dengan demikian kita harus tahu juga normal range pasien itu berapa tekanan darahnya. Nggak sama ya. Dan kita harus tahu juga, kalau punya NIRS, kita harus tahu juga baseline. Yang penting bukan nilai absolut, tapi tren dari RSO2 itu yang harus dicermati. Sekali lagi, kita harus tahu status kardiovaskular pasien. Tidak semua tekanan darah turun itu harus diterapi. Hati-hati dengan prinsip flow berbanding terbalik dengan resist, resistensi. Kemudian juga jangan dilupakan apakah ventilasi kita lebay, hiperventilasi atau hipoventilasi, karena ini berhubungan dengan klik-klik kurva, disosiasi HbO2. Kalau hipo, hiperventilasi, pH-nya menjadi naik, maka oksigen itu akan kurvanya bergeser ke kiri sehingga oksigen lebih susah untuk dilepaskan ke jaringan. Demikian pula jika klik please. Suhu. Suhu yang rendah juga sangat berpengaruh terhadap shifting dari kurva ini dan kita harus ingat bahwa pasien-pasien geriatrik sangat rentan untuk mengalami hipotermia sepanjang pembedahan. Boleh lanjut? <tuh> Kemudian apakah anestesia itu cukup adekuat bagi pasien? Jangan lupa bahwa nyeri juga berhubungan dengan POCD. Baik, kita lanjutkan. Ada beberapa ide untuk prevensi yang diutarakan dari berbagai literatur, katanya antara lain dexamethason, COX-2 inhibitors, tapi di semua hipotetikal ya. Kita lanjut. Minosiklin dan prebiotik ini kan eh, sedang diteliti ya banyak pasien di ICU juga mendapat prebiotik dan katanya mempunyai efek yang bagus untuk mencegah sepsis. Kemudian yang tadi sudah disebutkan antikolinergik. Oke semuanya masih eh, meraba-raba. Yang jelas adalah eh, kondisi disfungsi kognisi ini dapat dicegah sebetulnya. Bukan sama sekali dicegah, tapi diperlambat datangnya dengan eksersis otak. Jadi kalau orang tua kita kakek nenek itu serang melakukan uh, uh, apa namanya teka-teki silang misalnya atau atau kurang itu boleh dilatih ya bisa diajarin main game apa asal jalan mobile legend aja. Tapi artinya otak itu akan kalau otak itu terus aktif maka uh, kemungkinan dia untuk turun kognisinya itu lebih lambat dan Jangan lupa fasting sesingkat mungkin dan ternyata hubungan sosial, interaksi sosial pasien dengan keluarga dan significant others itu cukup berarti dengan kondisi sekarang di mana pasien dilarang untuk ditemui pasca beda itu agak susah juga ya karena hubungan sosial itu ternyata penting juga untuk pasien-pasien geriatri. Butek boleh kita lanjut? Jadi. Sebetulnya kalau kita terakhir uh, lagi, yap, tidak ada satupun yang pasti untuk uh, teknik anestesia maupun obat yang dapat betul-betul mencegah uh, POCD. Jangan lupa juga bahwa POCD bisa timbul karena sebab lain pasca beda, misalnya infarkt, sepsis, dan emboli. Baik. Yang penting adalah kita harus berusaha dengan multidisciplinary approach, holistic care, dan jangan lupa kasih sayang untuk pasien-pasien geriatrik kita. Lanjut. Jangan lupa kalau membuat pasien tertidur, jangan lupa dibangunkan lagi ya. Oke, terima kasih Prof. Rita. Terima kasih semua. Terima kasih Dr. Ratna Farida untuk kuliahnya yang interesting dan Jelas. So we will move to the next speaker, and actually it's related with the frail that already mentioned by Dr. Ratna Farida. Please, Professor Gabriela. Uh, your topic is about a frail geriatric surgical patient. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, uh, you have thirty minutes from now. Thank you. Uh, uh, am I able to manage my slides? Uh, no, I have to ask every time to you, sorry, to go to the next one. I think, uh, Krisa, 
and the Prof. Gabriela manage her slide? Yes, yes, we can okay. do it from here. Okay, but the slide disappeared. Okay, hold on a second. Okay, but I can't. Uh, I cannot uh, proceed with the slide. In any case, uh, let's uh, avoid uh, losing time. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, important congress uh, to which I've uh, uh, devoted, if you want. Uh, the topic I have to speak about is the frail surgical patient, which represents an increasing patient group, substantially due to a couple of factors. The first one is that the volume of geriatric surgery has increased significantly in the last years, but also among older surgical patients, frailty is more frequent than in the general geriatric population. Frailty remain for those who deal with geriatric surgery a main concern because of many studies has demonstrated that frailty is in the factor for periodic complications and mortality. The next one, please. The next, please. I can't, uh, I'm unable to, okay, thank you. If you <laughs> look at the midline uh, looking for uh, frailty and surgery, you can see that uh, in the interval between uh, 1983 and uh, 10 days, uh, 10 years ago, the number of uh, published studies uh, reached uh, to three and uh, 119 records. Uh, the majority of them collected in the last 10 years. The next one, please. But if you look at this slide, this is even more impressive because in the last five years, a great amount of studies was collected, was conducted on frailty and surgery. And presently, the total of papers that you can find on Medline in the interval 1982-2022 is much more than 4,000 studies. And again, the next, please. The next, please. The next, please. I'm really sorry, but I have no way to manage my slide. Okay. Uh, what about the forecast for the future? Um, Fowler, uh, uh, predict, predicts that uh, by 2030, something like one fifth of the uh, 75 years old and older patient will have surgery annually in the UK. Up of uh, 26 of them uh, uh, aged 85 will be frail. And this of course uh, will turn in a great pressure and in a great burden on hospitals and healthcare system. So um, there, will, there is, need to better investigate and manage this uh, uh, patient group. Uh, let's consider that presently frequently is not yet routinely evaluated in the preoperative risk assessment. Uh, next one, please. Again, the next. Again, the, okay. How can we define a frail patient? A rough definition includes uh, the fact that they are frequently older or oldest old. Uh, however, globally speaking, 10% of over 65 are frail. Uh, the main patterns are represented not only by aging, but by polypathology and other associated conditions such as disability or dementia, troubles in equilibrium or in gait. And this is uh, one of the main uh, uh, apparent uh, uh, signs of frailty. Uh, and this is so true that uh, simply looking the way an older patient uh, uh, works, we can uh, suppose uh, that probably he is frail. Muscular weakness is also very uh, characteristic of this patient group. And also there are some alterations in body composition as I will explain in the next uh, slide. Those patients are at the increased risk of rapid worsening in general status and mostly adverse reaction to surgical aggression. The next one, please. 
The next one, please. The next one is okay. Uh, is there a definition of frailty that can be used for scientific purposes? It was observed years ago that uh, not only there is a known clear official definition, for instance, there is no uh, an, uh, international uh, uh, standard of diseases uh, or uh, other uh, official definitions for frailty. Um, and for many years, the term has been used loosely. Uh, today also, many of those who are not educated in geriatrics use uh, the term frail loosely. It is important to consider the term in its uh, real scientific value, even though we don't have an um, official uh, definition. <laughs> Pride, who is one of the older that firstly approached the matter in 2004, provided this definition. It's a frailty is an age-dependent status consisting of reduced resistance to stressors. This is the key element, reduced resistance to stressors, and related to cumulative physiologic decline, comorbidity, disability, risk of institutionalization, and that. The next one, please. A more recent definition by the author I quoted a few slides ago uh, is again uh, a definition that uh, focuses on the state of vulnerability due to stress or event that can significantly alter the physiology and function and that result in adverse outcomes, including a reduction in mobility, cognitive decline such as delirium, uh, and increase the level of dependency. Here you can see how surgery impacts on an independent patient or uh, on a dependent one. The next, please. The next. Um, the very reputed uh, English geriatrician, uh, Judge Desi, provided the pathophysiological definition of frailty that uh, should be defined as a decrease in physiological reserves across multiple organ system, leading to increased vulnerability. You can see that vulnerability is the key element. The frail individual is at risk of crossing the threshold from independence to dependence after a stress or event infection, but also surgery. This is why a patient, excellent, thank you, stay, uh, stay there. This is why a patient can enter in the hospital in an, um, su a sufficient state of autonomy, and after surgery, he is lose his autonomy and is become dependent. This is what frequently happened to frail patients. Uh, if I wanted to recur to modelistics uh, to provide a definition of frailty, there are two fundamental models. One that uh, recalls uh, to biomedical paradigm and that consider a physical phenotype uh, with the um, measurable items such as uh, reduction in uh, muscle strength, uh, malnutrition, uh, reduced functional status and so on. And another one is uh, uh, related to the so-called so biopsychosocial paradigm that consider that the frailty is uh, something coming from a multi-domain phenotype. And uh, this, uh, in other ways, uh, um, suggests that uh, uh, we should use to word older patient and holistic approach. Sorry for the BAP approach. It was an error that I see now. <laughs> Delay the B and consider holistic approach. And uh, CGA, Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment, is an effective tool that allow us to have a global vision of our patient. The second one model has shown it to be uh, more predictive, uh, and there is increased evidence that uh, a gate speed as a monoparametric screening tool seems to be uh, a good one. The next, please. And again, one. Next, okay. Um, 
when speaking about the conceptual model of frailty based on uh, phenotype, the so-called physical uh, model, uh, frailty identification is easier because uh, I have some uh, signs to track, for instance, the weakness, the weight loss, the uh, 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 easy, uh, contraction of viral infection, obesity, comorbidity, and so on. <clears throat> the next one, please. Next. The next, okay. Uh, if I look at the deficit accumulation model, I, this is a more predictive, if you want to show the way in which both biomedical and psychological influences can lead to frailty. For instance, there are biomedical factors and psychological social factors and environmental stress that act on a physiological, on a limited physiological capacity to uh, withstand environmental stress. And this, uh, of course, um, in uses increase the, the dependency. The next one. Uh, what are the relationships between frailty, disability, and comorbidity? There is a proportion of frail older patients who don't meet the common criteria for comorbidity or for disability. Uh, frailty is not synonymous with either comorbidity or disability, but comorbidity is a risk factor for frailty and the disability is an outcome of frailty. The next one, please. Um, this slide is quite interesting because it represents the uh, evolution a long time of frailty as a, a biological state. Frailty is something that is organized into a cycle, into self-perpetuating cycles of naturally progressive events. For instance, there is, a, as you can see here, there is the weight loss that need, leads to sarcopenia. Sarcopenia leads to reduced strength. Reduced strength may may lead to increased risk of falls. And if you fall, uh, your walking speed reduces, uh, reduces your level of activity, and uh, it also the total uh, energy expenditure uh, reduces. And again, I have a weight loss, and I restart for a following uh, group of self-perpetuating falls. The next one, please. The pathophysiology, essential pattern, as it was recalled by a number of uh, frailty definitions, stays in latent vulnerability. But uh, we can also find uh, some biological determinants that are those who are at the base of the aging processes, the chronic inflammatory uh, status and immunosenescence. Uh, inflammaging is the, the paradigm of this. Uh, uh, there are hormonal deficits, of course. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, studies focused on uh, the telomere shortening. Uh, this is uh, something uh, that uh, uh, is closer to laboratory medicine that, uh, uh, than to our clinical experience. However, it is uh, uh, an important aspect, a biologically important aspect. Um, another aspect is represented by the loss of adaptive capability, if that is if you want the real essence of uh, aging. The next one, please. Uh, there are individual and social determinants. Sarcopenia remains one of the main aspects under the biological point of view. However, there are also further determinants such as acute or chronic stress, depression, uh, reduced level in activity, reduced protein intake, social isolation, smoking, alcohol abuse, etc., polypathology and polypharmacy. As you can see here, the approach is much more holistic. The next one. Please, the next one. Again, the next. The next, okay. Uh, just uh, some epidemiological data. Uh, frail is present in the surgical population for accounts for 50% of the uh, patients undergoing cardiac and vascular surgery. 
almost 40 for patients undergoing cancer surgery, 23 among those who undergo elective orthopedic surgery. Uh, what is important to consider is that the, the mean values of prevalence in the surgical population, which is almost 20%, is significantly higher in comparison with the, the general population where the prevalence of frailty is uh, 11 and something more. The next one. What can we do to early identify patients who are frail during the operative anesthesia consultation? Time to get up and go test is a, a very known, is an evidence-based test and provides a strong suspect that my patient is frail. CGA, of course, uh, it explores a lot of domains that uh, helps in me in understanding the globality of the patient's condition. However, there are also biological markers, as I say, and predictors, for instance, hypoalbuminemia, hypocholesterolemia, higher inflammatory markers, and also situations such as polypathology, polypharmacy, sarcopenia, disability, and dementia. The next, please. This is the time at the get up and go test. It is so well known that I don't uh, lose my time to comment it. The next, please. About biological markers. Hypoalbuminemia is not uh, uh, always related to malnutrition. And when uh, he, it is associated with disability, this highly suggests uh, the presence of frailty. Hypocholesterolemia is often associated with malnutrition. However, the association with hypoalbuminemia indicates a high risk of mortality. And about inflammatory markers, they are often associated with troubles in the metabolic homeostasis. High levels are associated with high morbidity and mortality risk in the elderly, and they are often associated with sarcopenia. The next, please. How can we measure frailty? There are two main groups of tools. The first one is represented by surrogate single measures, and the second one by the scoring system of physical, cognitive, or functional capability. The next one. Here you can see this um, one uh, of the most <coughs> used. Uh, uh, surrogate single measure of frailty, the forearm grip strength. Um, the popularity of this test uh, uh, is due to the fact that it takes a very, very short time to be performed and it gives us the illusion, in my modest personal opinion, that I understood if my patient is frail or not. Probably uh, this uh, um, indicates me that the patient I'm facing is frail. Certainly, it doesn't provide any element to understand what are the reasons why this patient is frail. That is why surrogate single measures are very limited in their usefulness, because knowing that my patient is frail or not doesn't allow me to design, to plan a corrective action before surgery. The next, please. <laughs> The gait speed is probably the best among the um, uh, monoparametric tools. However, it doesn't identify areas of modification. The next one, please. Fried score, uh, fried, uh, the odor I mentioned before, uh, identified the uh, um, fa uh, fa a number of factors such as weight loss, fatigue, reduced muscular strength, reduced physical activity, reduced gait speed, and uh, uh, in such a way analyzed a lot of uh, uh, factors and uh, areas of activity in uh, uh, accordance with the, what uh, he uh, wrote, uh, frailty diagnosis uh, is based on the presence of three items among those mentioned here. The next one, please. Mm, much more appreciable, in my opinion, the Edmonton scale that consider 
is something like uh, if you want a comprehensive geriatric assessment because uh, cognition is uh, evaluated with the clock test. The general health status uh, on the number of hospital admissions in the last uh, month or so weeks. The level of functional dependence uh, using uh, basic activities of daily life. Uh, is social support present or needed? How many medications my patient uh, take, uh, five or more? Uh, did he uh, lose, uh, at least, uh, add the uh, weight loss? Uh, what is uh, his mood? Is it uh, in, in affected by continence uh, or, or not? Um, again, uh, the two test is one of uh, uh, the elements considered by the Edmonton scale. The rating uh, is that each factor is score zero to point and uh, uh, not frail have a, a total rating of zero five. The apparently vulnerable six to seven, the male frail eight to nine. The next one. Advantages and limits. I, as I told before, surrogate measures are simple, reproducible, identify subject at risk of adverse uh, uh, surgical outcome, but uh, do not identify the areas for modification. Scoring case can be time consuming. We are always with the anxiety related to the time we need to perform our preoperative consultation, but in the elderly, this time is precious. And uh, the, also the scoring case highlights the areas of optimization, as I already said before. The next one, please. Again, the next one. <clears throat> please, the next. Please, the next. Oh, I'm losing a lot of time. <laughs> okay. Ah, that's why probably because the connection with the internet is not optimal. Oh. Um, in the surgical setting, frailty, in other words, the reduction in resilience is associated with an increased rate of postoperative complication, longer hospital stay, higher mortality rate at 30 days and 12 months, and a greater chance to become dependent at hospital discharge. The next one is... Here there is a quick panoramic of the main studies that appeared in the last uh, 10, uh, 14 years. Uh, this paper from Robinson uh, 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 that considered the 110 patients uh, scheduled from surgery uh, and evaluate uh, mortality and institutionalization at six months from the surgery. Uh, concluded that frailty markers predicted six month postoperative mortality and institutionalization. The next study also uh, reached the same conclusion. Frailty is a potent adjunctive tool to predict postoperative mortality. Next slide, please. In this study, the concept of prediction of mortality and morbidity uh, became uh, a, an operational uh, address, if you want, because this preoperative assessment tool, frailty uh, uh, assessment, may prove beneficial when weighing the risk and benefit of surgery, allowing objective data to guide surgical decision making and patient counseling. So we pass from assessing the risk, increase the risk of mortality, to the the awareness of having available a tool that can help us in decision-making about surgery in uh, older patients. The next, please. And this study also arrived to suggest us that um, we need further work in order to understand how are to, what are the target intervention that uh, can uh, improve the uh, outcome of these patients? The next, please. Prof. Gabriela, 
you have only five minutes left. Five yes, but I, you know, I spent all my time in asking the, your slides. I, I'm yeah. really sorry. How am I to say? <laughs> However, uh, okay, let's proceed. The next one. Guys, the next one, please. Again, the next. Advantages of assessing frailty that uh, once I have identified the patient as frail, I have to understand from uh, which kind of intervention he can benefit exercise, and correction of malnutrition, or uh, uh, introduction of drugs such as anabolic steroids or anticytokine agents. The next one, please. The pillars of appropriate perioperative management. I think that I will use this slide to arrive to the conclusions, otherwise we go out of the assigned time. The first step, early identification and assessing. And to reach this purpose, I need to be confident with comprehensive geriatric assessment, not only being able to use it to understand it, but also to share this knowledge with the team inside which I'm working. My surgeon has to understand what I mean when I speak about the comprehensive geriatric assessment. My nurses have to understand. <laughs> and when I speak about the frailty, uh, the, my preference should go toward multi-parametric frailty scores because they address me to adopt targeted interventions. The second pillar is targeted prehabilitation and correction of areas of vulnerability. So uh, physical and cognitive training in case of um, cognitive problem, correction of malnutrition, or of always minimization of sensory deficit. This is a, a uh, an area that is, if you want, more uh, closer to the postoperative delirium prevention. However, it is important in managing a frail patient just in the aim of reducing the risk of postoperative delirium. Uh, a third pillar is represented by the adaptation of the perioperative pathway to the patient needs. For instance, dedicated clinical pathways for geriatric patients. Uh, they are codified, well uh, defined in the literature, implementation of ERAS or fast track surgeries. And also the fourth pillar is the patient oriented decision making about surgery. Please go forward quickly because I go toward the conclusion. <coughs> okay, again, uh, go. Ideal screening tool for frailty are still lacking. This is the score that was uh, already presented by the pre previous uh, speaker. Uh, uh, again, the next one. The, the next one. This is what I already uh, described uh, before. The next one. This is some uh, literature supporting what I said. Again, the next one. The next, please. Uh, to adapt, uh, it's uh, useful in managing frailty. This is a, a paper from uh, very recent uh, from uh, Gillis, Leonquist, and Carly. Um, it, is, uh, it seems to be an implicit answer to a recent uh, review that uh, concluded saying, okay, um, correcting malnutrition is uh, uh, recommend. It should be recommended. Prehabilitation should be recommended. Uh, acting on areas of vulnerability should be recommended. However, if I look at the reviews, I can. I have forced to conclude that there is no cutting evidence about the effectiveness of these tools. This, of course, could generate a, a, a great misconception because the people uh, could stop using uh, improving uh, um, measures that are that we cannot consider that are not affected because we don't have evidence through the um, uh, systematic reviews. 
Uh, so uh, three authors, uh, two of them very, very famous, such as Olli Ljungvist and Franco Carli, recently stated, any preoperative condition that prevents a patient from tolerating physiologic stress of surgery, cardiopulmonary reserve, sarcopenia, impairs the stress response, such as malnutrition or flate, and or augments catabolic response to stress, is a risk factor for poor surgical outcome. So, prehabilitation, exercise, nutrition, can be, should be applied to strengthen physiological reserve, errors can achieve optimal outcomes because recovery is not a process that begins preoperatively. The next one, please. Uh, another important area is represented by the patient-oriented decision about surgery, considering uh, what is uh, the uh, impact of surgery on the vital, vital functions and what are the patient needs surgery is aimed to satisfy increased quality of life, increased life expectancy, self-sufficiency recovery, pain relief. The next please. The patient should be considered on an holistic perspective because what an elderly person, an older person, an oldest old wanted to do of his life is part of his uh, uh, mental and existential independence. So uh, uh, it is important, uh, the next one, please, to understand if my patient wants to be there, for instance, in one, two, three years, because his grandson now will get married, or if he won't live with uh, his partner as long as possible, he, he or she won't maintain the body image, or if he or she refuses to lose independence, to have a stoma, to lose a breast, to risk uh, and die, to end up what should I do, dears? I um, I cannot. Okay. So how should we manage this situation? Not not only respecting patient wishes, but also giving them the opportunity to think about and to provide psychological support. The next one. Please, the next one. Oh. So uh, about decision making, there are four main questions that uh, we should uh, uh, provide an answer. Are the goals of surgery like life? What a lifespan for this patient? What life expectancy? What expected quality of life? And what are the patient preferences? These are the main areas that I have to take in my mind when I have to decide about surgery in a very frail patient. The next one. The next one, please. I'm stopping, guys. Okay, to conclude, frailty represents a major risk factor in geriatric surgery, and its evaluation allows us to predict surgical outcome to plan perioperative course and to improve and tailor preoperative counseling. The next one, please. No ideal frailty assessment tool is presently available. If the evidence about the effectiveness of preoperative optimization and prelimitation pre is still low, however, <laughs> it should be in any case recommended. Frailty remains a major source of concern in geriatric surgery. Decision-making can be hard and we need certainly further research. The next again, <clears throat> the next please. Why should we anesthetists become familiar with frailty? Because preoperative evaluation is not an immobile science or art. It has to evolve together with epidemiology and the real world and changes in the surgical population. Anesthetists should be able to use preoperative evaluation tools appropriate for older and frail patients, should become or be familiar with comprehensive geriatric assessment, cognitive assessment, assessment of frailty and so on, because uh, uh, older patients are more and more frequent in our daily practice. The next one. 
I just conclude with William Shakespeare. We are all men in our own nature, frail, and this uh, uh, Murano glasses uh, <laughs> ideally represent. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Graviella. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, the discussion will come later on after the, all okay. the speakers have uh, presented their uh, topic. So we move to the next uh, speaker, and the, the expert is Professor Richard Griffiths. Uh, uh, the topic is about hip fracture anesthesia. It's special about hip fracture anesthesia, especially in light of the publication <laughs> of the game in NEGM. Please, Professor Richard. Uh, we're still trying to contact Professor Griffith if it's okay. Bernadette, do you want to go first? Yes, of yeah. course. Okay, so uh, Professor Fearing is come first before uh, Professor Griffith, yes? Please, you have seven yeah. minutes time. Um, excuse me. Yes, um, you only need to click the presentation. Uh, oh, I don't see it anymore. <laughs> I don't okay. see my presentation anymore. Okay, already. Uh, try so to I, take, I do share screen, okay? Yeah. And here, here it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. Yeah. great, fantastic. Put it in the slideshow, please. Do you have it? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's clear now. Is it there? Yeah. OK, I can start? Yes, you may. Yes, you can start now. OK. Thank you for the uh, invitation, especially uh, Professor Susili Chandra for the invitation. It's fantastic that we can interact in this way in this virtual meeting. I live and work in Leiden. Leiden is an old university town with many canals. It has a large university hospital. Now, the elderly population is the fastest growing segment of the Western world. As anesthesiologists, we are being faced with an ever growing number of elderly patients and perioperative management of geriatric patients is an important component of our surgical and anesthetic practice. The number of elderly patients is increasing. That is because of the baby boom generation is getting older. As you can see here on the roads, the, the, red, the red ones. Uh, in the last decade, the number of operations has been increased dramatically. On the right, you can see that even in the coming years in the world, the elderly population is increasing very fast. As we all know from daily practice, not all the people, not all the older people are the same. Older individuals tend to develop more concurrent medical problems as they age. One third of older patients have three or even more pre-existing diseases or complicating conditions. And four fifths have at least one complicating condition. There's a high prevalence of cardiovascular diseases, as we all know, in both men and women. And chronic obstetric, obstructive pulmonary diseases increase with age as well. The number of comorbidities is related to mortality, as you can see here. Um, so the more, the more uh, comorbidities have, the higher the chances to die after anesthesia. So surgical outcome decreases with advancing age. Elderly surgical patients are at increased risk of perioperative morbidity and mortality because of the high incidence of existing diseases. And emergency operations and major surgery like abdominal and thoracic cavities are risk factors for poor surgical outcome in the elderly. Preoperative assessment is performed to identify factors related to increased risk of complications and to recommend a treatment plan to minimize those risks. 
the preoperative assessment is crucial for planning the optimal perioperative care. Now, fortunately, in the last five years, a couple of guidelines have been issued for preoperative evaluation and perioperative management. The American College of Surgeons and the American Geriatric Society and the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland, and also the European Society of Anesthesiologists have guidelines which focus on optimal preoperative assessment. They recommend which factor should be evaluated to assess surgical risk in the geriatric patients. And here you see a checklist mentions to the American guidelines for the optimal preoperative assessment of the geriatric surgical patient. It involves physical, psychological, functional, and social issues. The same issues are mentioned also in the guidelines of the societies I just mentioned. I will focus a little bit on frailty, which is a relative new concept in the period of deaf care, especially for the anesthetist. All these guidelines outline frailty assessment as a critical component of the preoperative set operative setting. Now, Gabriele Bettelli has focused on this topic in her lecture, and I will just show uh, some details which are important for the preoperative assessment. As you know, as she said, but I just um, uh, rehearsed it a little bit, frailty is defined as an important syndrome of decreased physiological reserves and resistance to stressors. This is caused by cumulative decline across multiple physiological systems, and this may lead to vulnerability to adverse outcome. It represents the overall result of decreased physiological reserves across multiple organ systems. And as you said, as Dr. Brittani said, frailty phenotype was reported by Fried. This consists of five criteria, unintentional weight loss, four and a half kilo in the previous year, self-reported exhaustion, physical weakness, as, as you saw, slow walking speed and low physical activity. Now, frailty was defined when three or more of the above criteria were presented. It's not a synonymous with uh, a comorbidity or disability. However, comorbidity is a risk factor for frailty. Um, now, frailty was found to be a predictive tool for postoperative severity, morbidity, and mortality. And preoperative frailty using the FRIGHT criteria was associated with an increased risk for postoperative complications. From daily practice, we use always the ASA score, or some people lose, use the Lee and Eagle scores. And these are risk models which we use, but they are not including frailty. And um, when um, in this a study done by Macquery, you see when they did the ASA score and all the other scores, when they do did on top the frailty scores, then you saw that even the risk was higher. So that means frailty score is very important to adjust the preoperative the, the pre uh, risk management. So just to conclude, um, As you can see here, with frailty, you should do um, um, that we do have to do the risk assessment and can we optimize the frail patient preoperatively with proactive care of all the patients undergoing surgery interventions for their improvement are carried out so that the maximal level of function after the operation is associated with decreases in morbidity and mortality. Now, Intraoperatively, the focus is to minimize the stress response to surgery with less side effects in order to optimize the postoperative outcome. With increasing age, anatomic and physiological changes do occur. And as a consequence, changes in the pharmacokinetics and dynamics occur. And therefore, the sensitivity of drugs and anesthetic drugs increases. However, one should in, realize that increasing age is associated with a large variability, inter-individual variability in those requirements. 
The total body composition changes gradually with increasing age. The intracellular water content declines as people age, which may lead to a decrease of the total body water. Consequently, the adipose tissue will relatively increase somewhat more in women than in men. And the disposition, that's the distribution and elimination, may be altered by those changes in body composition. In the case of hydrophilic drugs like morphine, a reduction in apparent distribution volume may be anticipated with higher corresponding plasma concentrations. On the other hand, the distribution volumes of lipophilic drugs would be expected to increase with lower corresponding plasma concentrations and increase in the corresponding elimination half-life. For example, what you see here, this is a, a plasma curve versus concentration time profile during TIVA of propofol. Now the red curve is an older patient of 80 years old, and the white one, as you can see here, is a younger patient of 25 years. And what you see here, that the higher concentration during the infusion of an older patient compared to the younger one with the same dose. And this is because of a change in body composition and metabolic clearance. The central volume is decreased and therefore um, the plasma concentration is higher. And this has, of course, consequences. What you see here, this is a dynamic curve. What you see here, I will explain it. Aging is um, alters the pharmacodynamics um, of the same drug concentration. Here you see the dynamics of the unconscious effect to, to have the chance to have 80% um, to have 80 cons to be unconscious. And you can see here, that a 25 year old uh, male has a higher concentration, plasma concentration to achieve the chance to be unconscious than a 75 year old patient. They need less, less plasma concentration to achieve the same level of unconsciousness. And the changes in pharmacodynamics and kinetics lead to reduction of the induction dose and in infusions. 50% reduction in bolus dose, and for maintenance, a 30 to 50% lower infusion rate of propofol is needed. And also, as we all know from daily practice, the drop in blood pressure in the elderly patient is more profound after any given drug dose of propofol and will be reached later in the elderly. So you have to take care and infuse very slowly. Um, age affects also the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of remifentanil. On the right, you see that the central volume and the clearance of remifentanil decreases with increasing age, resulting in higher plasma concentrations. And what does that mean? That means that, as you see here on the left, the brain sensitivity is increased. That is the EC, as you can see here, the, the, the EC50, that's a measure um, for EEG depression is markedly decreased with increasing age. It appears that the bolus dose should be halved and infusion rates decrease to one third in the elderly to, to achieve the same effect. Elderly patients exhibit a greater dose drug response to benzodiazepines. And on this slide, you see the increased sensitivity to midazolam in elderly patients, and this appeared to be related to the altered uh, pharmacodynamic changes rather than altered pharmacokinetics. You see here, uh, elderly patients uh, need less uh, concentration, uh, plasma concentration to get the same effect as the younger ones. So the dose should be decreased. Um, Suhamadex, dose of Suhamadex, to facilitate rapid reversal from moderate neuromuscular blockage induced by ro 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 roku rocuronium was the same in younger and older patients. So to reverse um, neuromuscular blockage, you need the same dose of Sucamadex uh, in the elderly as compared to the younger ones. And this is an important uh, table, what you see here. 
uh, the doses are needed drugs in younger and older individuals. In general, the drug doses should be decreased by 30 to 50% in the elderly. So that's quite impressive. So uh, uh, the anesthetics drugs has a high inter-individual variability and one should in the elderly titrate till effect. So start low and go slow. Also, we know from daily practice that elderly patients exhibit an increased responsiveness to inhalation agents. The minimal alveolar concentrations, as we all know, the MAC, decreases with age and can be as much as 30% less by the age of 80. Now also, with regional anesthesia, the, the technique may be more difficult by anatomical changes, as you can see here. It's quite a challenge to do a spinal or an epidural in a, in a back like this. The duration of neural blockade is longer because of atrophy of the nerves and the condition, conduction velocity of the nerves, especially the motor nerves, um, especially the motor nerve is decreased. Elderly are more sensitive for local anesthetics and one should administer smaller doses. What you see here, the, this is the sensory block and this is the motor block. And you see here that um, the sensory block and the motor block are the duration is longer. And this was um, following a supracalificular block with ropivacaine. So that's a peripheral block. Dexmetodomidine uh, is a selective alpha-2 agonist and can be used as a sedative in combination with regional anesthesia. And the dose to require to achieve adequate sedation was lower for older patients. This study was performed in patients undergoing knee surgery on the peripheral nerve block. And as you can see here, the oldest group had a less, uh, nearly the half of uh, those compared to the younger ones. With this dose, there were no cardiovascular side effects. Now, every day we have to make the choice if an elderly patient will receive regional anesthesia or general anesthesia or a combination of both. And to make the choice, you have to look at outcome results. Now, um, um, there are three important pragmatic large randomized controlled trials. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, Richard Griffiths did, did, uh, did not um, have a talk, but maybe later, because he, he wanted to talk about the REGAIN study, which just has published um, in a New England Journal of Medicine. So this trial has been finished, um, but also, and there was no difference between in, in with hip fractures between spinal and general anesthesia in relation to outcome mortality and all other things. But um, I focus a little bit on this RAGA delirium trial, which has just uh, finished and published one month ago. So in 2020, 20, um, uh, 22 in the JAMA. And it is a large uh, multi-central trial uh, done, uh, performed in China. Um, and um, the Raga Delirium trial has published their results uh, months ago in the Yama. This trial compares regional anesthesia with no sedation. So that was either epidural or spinal with general, and, and they compared it with general anesthesia and elderly patients undergoing hip fracture surgery. The primary endpoint was the incidence of postoperative delirium at day seven. And there was no difference in the incidence and frequency of delirium between both anesthetic techniques. So it's quite important. Mm -hmm. And this study is also a uh, very large randomized controlled trial, which has, will, is performed in Germany, mm -hmm. and it is still ongoing. And they, they also will have a lot of uh, patients included. Mm -hmm. So when you have large randomized control studies like this, then you maybe you can have a conclusion about the comparison between regional and general anesthesia. Um, 
we all know from daily practice that the number of elderly patients increases um, and that we are confronted with an increasing number of patients with dementia. And dementia is a common condition in the elderly population with an estimated prevalence of 8% in persons above 65 years of age and even up to 33% of patients above 85 years of age in parts in the Western world. Now, the most important risk factor for developing dementia is increasing age. And recently, a guideline statement for the perioperative care of people with dementia was published in Anesthesia. And the guidelines give recommendations how to deal with patients with dementia in the perioperative phase. The guidelines include some practical recommendations for anesthetic care. The burning question, of course, always is if their cognitive state may deteriorate in the perioperative period. And uh, in these guidelines, and we all know that we should avoid benzodiazepines and anticholinergic drugs, as the first speaker has already told. Avoidance of excessive depths of anesthesia is also recommended and avoidance of too much opiates. And at the end of the preoperative assessment, a clear management plan should be place, should be in place, which should include optimization of comorbidities, that is proactive care, of course, a medication review, and communication with the ward regarding room allocation and dementia-friendly side rooms. And the best anesthetic technique to use in patients with cognitive impairment is still uncertain, as we have um, understand of the first speaker. But it's important to minimize physiological and psychological stress and allow for a rapid recognition, recovery of cognition. Now, postoperative delirium in the elderly patient is a frequent complication in approximately 15 to 20 percent of major operation and is associated with poor functional outcomes and functional recovery and also longer intensive care state. It has a sudden onset, a reversible state of, and fluctuates during the days. It often starts in the recovery room and occurs up to five days after surgery. A few therapeutic measurements for postoperative delirium are available but prevention remains the best option. The European Society of Anesthesiologists have composed evidence-based guidelines and consensus-based recommendations for the prevention and treatment of postoperative delirium, as you can see here. Now, what are their, their, um, their guidelines and recommendation? Prevention and treatment of postoperative delirium. In this table, you see the factors how to prevent and treat postoperative delirium. The recommendation for prevention and treatment are summarized. I will focus on monitoring depths of anesthesia. It was recommended to, to BIS uh, guided anesthesia with values between 40 and 60, which is associated with not too deep anesthesia. This issue is this issue to use depths of anesthesia monitoring will continue to be controversial. Also mentioned is adequate pain treatment. And uh, I will give some details about this issue about pain treatment in the elderly later in this talk. As I said, it's controversial about this PIS. Uh, recently in the YAMA, it was investigated whether EEG guided anesthesia administration decreases the incidence of postoperative delirium. And in a study of more than 1,200 elderly patients between 60 and 95 years of age undergoing major surgery, it was shown patients were randomized to receive either EEG, guided anesthesia administration, or usual anesthetic care. And all patients received general anesthesia with a volatile agent. The primary outcome was delirium. And, um, uh, the conclusion was that in older adults undergoing major surgery, EEG guided anesthesia administration did not decrease the incidence of postoperative delirium compared with usual care. 
despite successfully reducing anesthetic exposure and duration of EEG suppressed. So it, it remains controversial. Um, advanced dementia patients may be at substantial risk for undetected or undertreated pain, unfortunately. And now Morrison showed and examined the treatment of pain in hip fractures in patients with advanced dementia and, and compared it with cognitively intact patients with hip fractures. Now pre, you can see here, pre and post-operative, the patient with dementia received substantially less forged morphine than the cognitively intact patients. So that's quite severe, I think. So patients with advanced dementia received only one third the analgesia of their cognitively intact counterparts. And as, as I've shown you in the, in the slides, inadequate analgesia contributes to delirium postoperatively. But we all know from daily practice how difficult it is in patients with advanced dementia to adjust the pain um, uh, severity. You have to look at facial expressions and at grooming. It's quite difficult when you have no communication. Um, so it needs a lot of observations. And um, uh, in the world, um, groups are busy now uh, to develop um, ob observational pain measurement tools and um, the proxy rating scales to see what the pain can be and to mention it to look at facial expressions, body movements, focalizations. And there are now some more uh, proxy rating skills. Profiling. Yes, I'm, fe I'm five minutes left. I I'm finished now. OK, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, to summarize, as I've shown you, this lecture has shown that the number of elderly surgical patients is increasing and the inter-individual variability is very high. All the patients are at high risk surgical population because of a reduction in functional reserve. The risk is increased in number of comorbidities with emergency operation and with thoracic and abdominal surgery. Um, as I've shown, frailty independently associated with increased perioperative risk. Therefore, a perioperative management plan should address the individual deficits, likely complications and surgical goals. Elderly um, patients are more sensitive to anesthetic drugs and one should try to trade the drugs. And as I show you now, growing, it's a growing number uh, of uh, people suffering from dementia and pain and under treatment of pain of cognitively impaired patients occur, unfortunately, and this may be associated with a higher incidence of delirium. And postoperatively, we should use multimodal analgesia. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Firi. And uh, because of uh, Lisa said that the Professor Griff is uh, not yet present now, so we will just jump to the question and uh, answer uh, session. I will look at the chatting room, and there's many questions for you all. But most of the question goes to Professor Gabriela. Yeah, here I am. Uh, can you just read by yourself or shall I read it for you? Sorry, would you repeat please? Because I couldn't understand. Yes, the question is in the chat room. Can the you read by yourself in the chat room? Or maybe I can just read it for you. I cannot understand what you mean. I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, so I will, I will just read it, the question for you. Most of the question does go to Professor Gabriela. Okay. Yeah. Please okay. St uh, start to reading them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the question is: um, 
any simple measurement that we can do preoperatively for geriatric patient, especially when we only have limited time. And the second question also to you, what about errors in geriatric patient, especially for the frail one? Is okay. it possible? Uh, these are the two questions. Yeah, Please. about the first question was uh, uh, if there are uh, quick, the easy to be performed tests to evaluate older surgical patients, is it? Uh, yes, uh, if the anesthetists have limited time. Yes, oh, yes I know. Uh, this is uh, uh, unfortunately a factor that affects our practice since the origin. And I think that uh, as a, a professionals group, uh, we should uh, uh, adverse uh, such a general attitude because uh, our work is uh, continuously becoming uh, uh, more complex uh, and our responsibilities are wider. So time is important, of course, under the organizational point of view. Nevertheless, when we need more time to perform our evaluation, we should put, uh, uh, be put in the condition of having this time. Consider a surgeon that has to perform a surgery which in real times appears to be much more complicated than time requiring that it was expected. What should he do to close the patient? Or to have, to be allowed to do his work in the best way we are living a moment of uh, transitions, no doubt, because uh, the uh, population aging uh, uh, is probably the main factor that has uh, um, uh, put it under the light of the criticism, uh, the value of time when we uh, have to uh, preoperatively evaluate the patient. If I have to evaluate a young, a fit, uh, no comorbid, uh, with no uh, medication uh, patient, of course, uh, I uh, am very quick. However, our administrators should understand that uh, uh, assigning the time for preoperative anesthesia consultation cannot be made in an automatic way. For a given patient, I need uh, 10, 15, uh, 20 minutes. For other patients, I need longer time. Do you want that I'm able to individuate patient at risk to define the uh, strategies that are aimed to reduce the risk? Okay, you have to give me the needed time. And I have to interact with my directors, with the top management of the hospital, in order to make them aware about the fact that our practice today is completely different in comparison to what happened 20, 40 years ago. Of course, I have to optimize my resources. Uh, we anesthesiologists, all, uh, all aware in the world, apart from the United Kingdom and the USA, where the culture of geriatric surgery and anesthesia is something well established and well practiced. Consider that the Coalition for Quality in Geriatric Surgery issued something like uh, uh, 400 quality indicators about preoperative pre evaluation. So <laughs> Uh, this uh, gives uh, you an idea about how uh, deeply they went in the matter. Apart from that, uh, we anesthesiologists in the rest of the world uh, usually do not receive education in uh, geriatrics. And that is why I founded uh, a couple of uh, years ago a second level university master in perioperative uh, geriatric medicine, which is open to anesthesiologists to surgeons, to geriatricians, and to nurses in order to develop a team-based culture, 
a team-based approach to the geriatric patient. This uh, master is, uh, um, be has become uh, international. Uh, this year we have uh, uh, attenders from uh, Australia, from Nor Norway, from Belgium, and also from Italy, of course. And uh, uh, attenders are enthusiastic because uh, uh, they have one year of time, 10 educational modules, one uh, per month, uh, during uh, the whole Friday and uh, the morning of the uh, Saturday to uh, receive uh, lessons, uh, lectures, and so on by a group of teachers, uh, experts in the field. And uh, every time they say, but uh, this is a continuous discovery because uh, nobody uh, taught us about that. So we are living a very difficult moment in which all our strategic ability to make our managers aware about the importance of our role, we have to become the manager of ourselves and of our category. If you want, I can suggest you that uh, you can perform a comprehensive geriatric assessment in 20 minutes. And this probably will solve the, the uh, practical aspects of the question that uh, was addressed to me. However, I'm happy to take the, this occasion to speak with all of you about the importance of becoming manager of our professions because our anesthesiologists are those who have, are entitled and in charge for the patient safety, for preventing complications, for uh, controlling pain, and uh, uh, many, 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 many times ago, we, we simply were the uh, professionals who injected uh, some drugs. Today, our profession is completely different. And the rest of the healthcare system has to understand this. What do you think about? Um, I just want to ask you uh, more about the limited time. <laughs> it, in emergency cases, which the simple measurement that you advise us to do it simple, but it is valid. Which one? So sometimes the assessment. limited time comes not from managers and the surgeon, <laughs> but because of the patient uh, condition. Okay, uh, uh, to use a comprehensive geriatric assessment that includes a number of variables that can be checked during the moment when the patient is in our uh, office for the preoperative anesthesia consultation, while he is waiting to be received by the anesthesiologist, he is queuing, there is a nurse who is of course organizing the process and the nurse can check about uh, social and family support or the need uh, to be uh, uh, assisted by uh, a person which is not a, a family member. Then he also, the, the nurse can score the abilities, the uh, inst basic instrument, basic activities of daily life and the instrumental activities of daily life. This will take uh, seven six, seven minutes, and then the patient arrives to my office. I, of course, visit him. And in that moment, I have to administer a cognitive test that could be a clock test. Minimental just requires five minutes, if you want, seven minutes. Or uh, what else? I have to, uh, of course, uh, review the medication and understand what uh, inappropriate medication should be withdrawn. And at this point, uh, I also have to check uh, the visual or auditory impairment uh, uh, in case this is present. Once I have uh, check the, all these factors, the time I sign it to my consultation probably will remain the same or will be longer five minutes, seven, ten minutes, because I have distributed along the 
presence of the patient in my office while queuing and while attending, uh, while uh, speaking with me, all the variables that are included in comprehensive geriatric assessment. However, if I don't know this, I cannot have a clear idea of how is my patient and what are their conditions and the, their risk factors and the prognosis. This is my firm uh, opinion. If you want, we can ask the surgeon who is the first person who visits the patient to anticipate uh, some questions related, for instance, uh, to the area of depression, which is an important risk factor in geriatric surgery. For instance, the surgeon could be asked by us anesthesiologists to systematically check with an older patient if he loses a family member in the last year, uh, the companion, some friend, his favorite pet, something like that. And to prevent me, when he asks me, send me the request, the, the request for preoperative anesthesia consultation, please sign that this patient is at risk of depression because he had the mourn, he had a, a great psychological pain in the last times. Okay, when I receive this request, I organize my preoperative anesthesia consultation, assigning patients who are at risk of depression in the weekdays, it could be the Monday, the Friday, depending on the internal organization, where I know that I am a psychologist available for three hours, four hours. He stays near my office where I uh, perform the anesthesia consultation on Monday. And when I receive the request from the surgeon, uh, those patients that the surgeon indicated to be at risk of depression will schedule it for the Monday when the psychologist is present. This will allow to start perioperative psychological support in advance, because you know that probably there are two uh, main areas of difficulties. One is represented by finding a psychological support to be available uh, as soon as possible when uh, the patient arrives to our observation till the hospital discharge. Then we will organize the, the thing in other ways. Another important area is if the patient lives alone, please, surgeon, put on your request. Be aware that patient lives alone in a home which is far from the town and so on. This means that that patient will certainly have need for social support after hospital discharge. The same mechanism. If you surgeons uh, uh, prevent me about this, I will uh, ask the patient to come to the preoperative anesthesia consultation on Friday, because on Friday I have a social operator which has been assigned to preoperative anesthesia consultation for three hours. And during that period, the, the social operators will uh, understand how is the situation. Probably he will plan a visit to the home of the patient in order to check for architectural barriers or something like that. And the, in other words, uh, it's a question of organization. But we cannot uh, uh, consider that uh, our preoperative anesthesia consultation today is the same that it was when our our patients were younger, more fit, and in better conditions. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Prof. Graviera. And maybe we, we will move to the another question to another uh, presenter. Yeah. And there's one question, I think it's for Dr. Farida, Ragna Farida. How do we address frailty and cognitive issue to our colleagues. I think because you are the one that just uh, 
this ex, uh, expel this uh, test yeah about cognitive uh, problems yeah i think the question is how we build a team i i believe like that because we know we know that uh, this is our concern but not to the surgeons not uh, not yet our uh, our cardiac surgeons have already concerned about the ocd but not the others so uh, i think they have to uh, start to build the teamwork prof uh, uh, among us anesthesiologists the cutting specialist and also the gerontologist and we sit together uh, to to promote the 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 safety of geriatric patient who will undergo uh, surgeries. I think uh, it's time to build up together, Prof. Yes, but it is not the easy one <laughs> strategy. It is not an easy yeah. one. Okay, so uh, we move to Professor Fire. Uh, one question for you. So everybody get a question and have to answer that. Profiling, in what case do you administer midazolam, midazolam in elderly? In what case do you administer midazolam in elderly? Uh, well, um, when I need a sedation for the elderly during the regional anesthesia, I will give a very, very, very little dose uh, in midazolam if they are agitated. Okay, uh, so I hope the question is uh, clear enough for the one that uh, asked it. Okay, and we move again back to, because there's still time in my, my time is still time, uh, cell five. Is it okay, Krisa? Ben is ready to play, bro. <laughs> <laughs> the next is, so maybe one last question. For, okay. uh, again, for uh, Prof. Bernadette, again. Uh, Prof. Bernadette, what do you mean by the dementia-friendly room? Yeah, yeah. Um, that means that's a room, for example, that people understand that they are in a quiet room, um, that the light is okay, um, that there is no noise, that they have the feeling that they feel quite comfortable, things like that. So not much agitation, very quiet. That there also is also a, a clock that they understand what the time is, you know, so that, that they come in their schedule of a normal daily life as they had. Do you understand? Yeah. I think uh, Gabriela, you uh, that's okay, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's Actually, because, uh, because uh, uh, you can understand when somebody has a hip fracture and um, he, he, he comes with an ambulance to the operation uh, to, to the hospital, then in the emergency room, then in the operation room, so many other disturbances in from the daily life. Then, and then after the operation, they come in a room, they don't understand anything anymore and especially when it is a room with a lot of other patients so they should be in a quiet room where family can be there when they have the feeling that they are comfortable that's what it is yeah thank you uh, uh fearing actually i'm happy if i can just uh, ask every speaker about this talk many uh, many questions that it can be uh, goes to every every speaker but because Krisa is already there and just give his time to stop. Sorry for that. And thank you very much for this session. It is a, a very interesting discussion. And also for the attendee, please, sorry, because we can just uh, answer all the questions. So many questions for all the, uh, the presented. Thank you very much. Thank you, to, thank you to you for inviting thank you everybody. Us. Okay. Bye. And back to Krisa. We are welcome. Hi. Good, good, good luck with the with the and with the Indo Anesthesia Conference. And, um, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Indo Anesthesia. Bye, bye, Gabriela. Bye, 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 Bernadette. Bye, bye. It was a pleasure seeing you again. Bye. bye. Okay. All, the you all the best. All the best.
Let's you pray guys. for the best. Let's Bye. pray for let's pray for peace in the world. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. A great part to you all. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Professor. Bye.